Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. All right, guys, just finished the first one. Just all the things. I, I shouldn't have to do intro again, right? Just watch the first one. I'd recommend. Um, oh, this is the first one right here. Can monarchs commit crimes? We are doing the second one. On January. Trial of Charles. Charles. Excuse me. 1649. Let's go. Let's continue. January 20th, 1649. Charles I, King of England, Scotland, and Ireland, appeared before the English High Court of Justice. Hours earlier, he had been officially charged with tyranny, treason, and murder. Let's do it. Oliver Cromwell watched from a window as the king approached the Palace of Westminster under armed guard. According to people in the room, when Cromwell saw the king, he went white as a wall. He then went over to Lord President John Bradshaw, the guy who would be running the trial, and urgently whispered something in his ear. After a minute, Cromwell rose and addressed the larger group. My masters, he has come, he has come. I desire you to let us resolve here what answer we shall give to the king when he comes before us. For the first question he will ask us will be by what authority and commission do we try him? Under what authority did they put the king on trial? The true answer was that it all came from the House of Commons, who had unilaterally and illegally declared its own supremacy. In other words, their legal authority was thin. So that's why he went white, is that he immediately just realized when he saw the king, he started to get, like, itchy feet? Like, so he just then, when he saw him, was nervous of, like, what, what if he challenges our authority? Okay. Everybody knew this. For a time, the room was filled with an embarrassed silence. What on earth would they say to the king? Why didn't you think about this before? One of the commissioners named Martin spoke up. In the name of the commons and parliament assembled and all the good people of England. Write that down. Write it was down. a weak answer, but at least it was an answer. They'd go with that. The full High Court of Justice entered Westminster Hall, where they awaited the king. Lord President Bradshaw took center stage. He feared assassination, and so he wore on his head a giant bulletproof hat. Even his allies thought he looked ridiculous. King Charles entered the hall and took his place before the tribunal. Before the trial began, a complete list of the members of the tribunal was entered onto the record. Several seats were empty. When Lord Fairfax's name was called, the commander-in-chief of the parliamentarian army, a voice rang out from the gallery. He has more wit than to be here. It was the Lady Fairfax, his wife. Wild. This outburst was cause for- This is pretty tense. Even just, you know, it's portrayed by a bunch of squares. I like the simple, you know, helps you focus more on the story. And it, it feels- there's got to be a, a movie on this or something that I can watch. Wild. This outburst was cause for concern within the tribunal, most of whom had served under Lord Fairfax during the Civil War. Was he trying to send them a message, or was the Lady Fairfax speaking for herself? Unclear. Either way, nobody dared to remove the Commander-in-Chief's wife. After an awkward silence, Lord President Bradshaw moved things along. He opened up proceedings with a long speech about how this court was acting on behalf of God, justice, the House of Commons, the people, blah blah blah. Yada yada. He then instructed the Solicitor General John Cook, the lead prosecutor, to begin reading the charges against the king. Charles had something else in mind. When John Cook began reading, the king lightly tapped him with his cane and indicated that he would like to speak. Cook ignored him and went back to reading the charges. The king was baffled by this and tapped him even harder, causing the silver hilt on his cane to fall off and hit the ground with a loud bang. This would have sounded like a musket shot and it scared the living hell out of everybody. 
The entire room looked at the king as he bent down to retrieve his little ornament. The fact that nobody moved to help him. Imagine how scared uh, Bradshaw with with this whole um, preparation of having the bulletproof helmet. He must have reacted. All right. Down to Hence. retrieve his little ornament. The fact that nobody moved to help him was significant. Not his last humiliation of the day. Solicitor General John Cook went back to reading the charges, which concluded by condemning the king as a tyrant, traitor, murderer, and a public and implacable enemy of the Commonwealth of England. At this, Charles let out a quick burst of laughter. A traitor? A traitor against what? Himself? These charges made no sense. Lord President Bradshaw asked the king how he pled. Was he guilty, or did he maintain his innocence? Is it weird that I want both sides to lose it? The king responded, There are many unlawful authorities. The king responded, There are many unlawful authorities in this world. Thieves and robbers by the highway. But I would know by what lawful authority I was brought here. This is your moment. This is exactly what Cromwell had feared. It was a simple question, but it contained within it a sharp argument. First, and most importantly, before English law, a king could not be charged with a crime, for any reason, before any court. Everybody in the room knew this. The king wanted the tribunal to explain themselves. Second, even if a king could be charged with a crime, the legislation establishing the tribunal had been rejected by the House of Lords. So, under what authority was the king on trial today? It was a legitimate question. This got under Bradshaw's skin. His role as Lord President was not being shown the proper respect. He answered in a burst of anger, in the name of the people of England of which you were elected king. This was not the answer that they had all agreed to beforehand. Bradshaw had just made a massive blunder. It also gives us a hint as to how Bradshaw viewed the monarchy. Bradshaw had ties to radical Protestantism, and radical Protestants at the time used the word election to mean something that was random, arbitrary, and unearned. Bradshaw was a Republican, and that's how he secretly viewed the monarchy random, arbitrary, and unearned. The king pounced at Double this standard. slip of the tongue. He explained to the court that England had been a hereditary monarchy for a thousand years, and that he, as the heir to that tradition, stood, quote, more for the liberties of my people than any of my pretended judges. Therefore, show me by what authority I am seated here, and I will answer it. Charles could smell blood in the water. He knew that Very there was good. no precedent for what the High Court of Justice was doing here today. Clearly, they were just making it up as they went along. Bradshaw again asked the king to enter his plea. The king countered by asking on what legal authority he was brought here today. This went back and forth for quite a while, with Bradshaw becoming angrier and louder and more unhinged. Eventually, Charles said to Bradshaw, You have shown no lawful authority to satisfy any reasonable man. Bradshaw shot back. That is your apprehension. We are satisfied who are your judges. Charles replied, Tis not my apprehension, nor yours either, that ought to decide it. Lord President Bradshaw was extremely frustrated. He adjourned proceedings for the day. They would try again tomorrow. As Charles was being escorted out of Westminster Hall, people began to chant, God save the king! The soldiers in the courtroom tried to drown this out by shouting over top of them, Justice! It was pandemonium. In her book, The English Civil War, A People's History, historian Diane Perkis provides a really good summary of the first day of the trial. She describes, it's not very good that when I'm learning about the English Civil War, there are I I am I always think about politics in America right now, and that's not good. Uh, just seeing how 
factional people can be. And I'm a big believer that that laws, although many of them flawed and um, seemingly unjust, are there for not even just there for a reason, but if you undermine or start to create any laws in this manner, like the whole, um, what was it called, the something court, where there's only like 46 people. I'm seeing a lot of similarities between how people are acting here and how people are acting now in politics. And look, I don't care what, you know, Democrat, Republican, don't care. Voted for Trump, for Biden, for Hillary, voted against Brexit, for Brexit. I don't care. I'm only le- interested in if you want to learn about history. It doesn't matter one bit to me, your politics. And I'm just trying to point out that this is eerily familiar. Describes Charles's strategy as, quote, both intelligent and stupid. He was displaying bright legal maneuvering, but his recalcitrance was also a tactically dim way of getting everybody's goat. She's right. Charles was running circles around Bradshaw, but he was needlessly antagonizing him in the process. So far, the whole thing was a mess. On the second day of the trial, Lord President Bradshaw sought to take back the initiative and make sure that everybody recognized the High Court of Justice as a legitimate court of law. He began the day with another lengthy opening statement. He talked about the strong legal authority on display here today, and at the end, he asked Solicitor General John Cook to, once more, read the charges. When he was finished, Bradshaw again asked the King for his plea. The King calmly asked the High Court of Justice to show him upon what legal authority this trial was being held. Already they were back in this cul-de-sac. The king had clearly been working on his argument overnight, and he said to Bradshaw, This is not my case alone. It is the freedom and liberty of the people of England. And do you pretend what you will? I stand more for their liberties. For if power without law may make laws, may alter the fundamental laws of the kingdom, I do not know what subject he is in England that can be sure of his life or anything he calls his own. The king was trying to pull a switcheroo. The High Court of Justice had claimed to be acting on behalf of the people of England, but now Charles was trying to position himself as the true champion of liberty. He was arguing that if the aristocracy could ignore the rule of law and come after the king himself... Right, so if they're going to be unfair to the king, then how do you think they're going to be to you? Nobody in England was safe. This must have been laughable to those who remembered being thrown in prison for refusing to loan the king money, but here we are. Charles had skillfully maneuvered Bradshaw into a corner. Bradshaw interjected, Sir, I must interrupt you. Sir, it seems you are entering on arguments and disputes about the authority of the court before which you are convented as prisoner. You may not do it. Bradshaw was trying to say that questioning the legitimacy of the court was against the rules. Kind of weak, if you ask me. The king continued to speak, something about law and reason. Bradshaw cut him off again. You speak of laws and reason. It is fit. There should be law and reason. And those are both against you. The vote of the commons of England in parliament. That is the reason of the kingdom. It is the law of the kingdom. This last bit, about the commons being the law of the kingdom, was incorrect. Under normal circumstances, the House of Lords and the Monarch had to sign off on any new laws. The fact that the House of Commons had illegally declared its own supremacy was actually the central issue here, and reminding everybody of this actually kinda worked in the king's favor. It's puzzling why Bradshaw would go down this road. Right, it's sort of, in English terms, I'm not exactly sure, I know you have a you have a prime minister, and uh, the monarchy is more of a, f- a figurehead uh, type thing. But so it would be like if so the House of Commons and House of Lords is still a thing, right? It'd be like people overthrowing and and not letting certain people in who don't agree with them. And so like the House of Commons today just 
somehow taking control and saying, all right, the House of Lords no longer matters. The Parliament, uh, the uh, Prime Minister no longer matters. We're going to try this person right here. And being asked, okay, but what authority do you have? Well, we have the authority of the House of Commons. And it's like, well, you guys got rid of the Lords and the Prime Minister or King here. And, and so it, I, I don't, from what I know, I, I do not know a lot about um, Bradshaw or, or Charles. I don't like either of them, but that's just through what I'm learning here. But they both seem to be very wrong, and I don't really know who is more wrong. The king tried to interject, but Bradshaw cut him off again. Sir, you are not to dispute our authority. You are told it again by the court. Again, the king what tried to speak. What does that speak. mean? Sir, it will be taken notice of you that you stand in contempt of court. A contempt of court charge was a huge deal at this time. It meant that the trial could proceed without the defendant. The king replied to the Lord President, I do not know how a king can be a delinquent. Continuing later, he said, To demure against any proceedings is legal. I do demand that. The king was challenging the contempt charge on multiple fronts. He was saying, first, that a king cannot be held in contempt, and second, even if he could, simply asking, why am I here, is perfectly legal. So far, they had not really answered that question. Let's pause here for a moment. The king was behaving as if refusing to enter a plea was some kind of immovable force. This wasn't exactly true. English law had a provision for situations like this. If a defendant refused to enter a plea, the law at the time empowered the court to take the defendant outside and torture them until they changed their mind. For real. King Charles was making a bet here. He was betting that the High Court of Justice wouldn't dare torture the King of England. He was right. They wouldn't dare. Bradshaw and company believed, rightly in my opinion, that any mistreatment of the king would cause public opinion to swing in his favor. It might even set off a royalist uprising. Way too risky. Bradshaw tried a new argument. He told the king that they had put one of his predecessors on trial before, and that had been entirely legitimate. Now, I have no idea what Bradshaw is talking about here. Plenty of kings had been imprisoned or forced to step down, but nothing like this. Not a trial. Charles didn't know what he was talking about either. He interrupted Bradshaw. I deny that! I deny it! Show me one precedent! Bradshaw had made an assertion that he couldn't back up. His third major blunder. He responded, Sir, you ought not to interrupt while the court is speaking to you. The point of precedent is not to be debated by you. Bradshaw was saying with a straight face that this court of law was not interested in hearing precedent? What? Bradshaw feebly asked again for the king to enter his plea, and again the king responded that he would be happy to do so once he knew under what authority this trial was being held. Bradshaw had had enough and called for the prisoner to be removed. But the king had more to say. He called out, Wait, I require some time to state my reasons. Bradshaw responded in anger, Sir, it is not for prisoners to require. The king replied, Sir, I am not an ordinary prisoner. Bradshaw started shouting again, but Charles talked over him and just started giving his speech anyway. He got to a part where he said that it was, quote, for the liberty, freedom, and laws of my subjects that I ever took up. He stopped himself. Charles had just made a mistake. He was going to say, took up arms, but this would have been an admission that he had started the Civil War. He corrected himself, defended myself with arms. I never took up arms against the people, but for the laws. That was a close one. At last, the king was taken away under guard. The calls of God save the king and justice followed him out of the room. In the commotion, one of the members of the tribunal, a cobbler named John Hewson, pushed through the crowd and spat in the king's face. 
Charles calmly wiped his face clean, telling the cobbler, Well, sir, God hath justice in store for you and me. Finally, day two of the trial was over. It was a disaster. You wouldn't have thought it possible, but Bradshaw had mucked things up even worse than on day one. King Charles was successfully positioning himself as a champion of the liberties of the people. And so I, on one side, I completely agree that King Charles did, deserves to be, it's, it's, it's like if, um, you, you, you like set up someone for jail and you, you found the murder weapon in their house, but you weren't allowed to go in there to get it. And so you can't admit, you know, the, the evidence. And it's like, well, you have the murder weapon, you know, it's here, but you can't just let go of the rules and, and put it in there. And so I'm of the belief, well, now you can't admit that evidence because it's not just about that case. It's about everything. And so I get why King Charles is being tried and why people are so angry with him. I would be very angry as well. But at the same time, I do not like how uh, Bradshaw is going about this at all. Just making up stuff and set, trying to... So it just seems like two people trying to defend themselves and their own argument, not with facts, but just through some wordplay to win over people. And whoever wins over the most people is going to get what they want in the end. And Bradshaw had failed to stop him. There was no excuse for the trial to be going this badly. That evening, Oliver Cromwell and some others met with Bradshaw and urged him to change tactics. This wasn't working. Bradshaw maybe didn't fully appreciate this, but people were terrified. Nobody knew if this new regime would survive. Members of the tribunal were actually being persuaded by the king's arguments. They now feared that the tribunal was not a legitimate court of law. Something had to change. No one ever wants, like, there's nothing wrong with that. No one ever wants things to play out justfully. They just want things to work out the way they want it to work out. And whenever they hit a, a snag, they just try and find some way out of it. Day three of the trial began in the old, familiar way. The king was hauled in, and Solicitor General John Cook read the charges. After yet another lengthy speech, How do you Bradshaw plead? What authority? asked the king for his plea. What authority? This time, Charles was silent. He appeared to be deep in thought. Finally, he spoke up. When I was here yesterday, I did desire and begin to speak for the liberties of the people of England. I was interrupted. I desire to know yet whether I may speak freely or not. This was different. Bradshaw was caught off guard. He stumblingly told the king that he could not enter into a discourse at this time, and that first he must answer the charge laid before him. The king was well prepared. He raised his voice so everybody in the room could hear. For the charge, I value it, not a rush. It is the liberties of the people of England I stand for. He was playing to the crowd now. Bradshaw was instantly enraged. He rose to his feet and took a few steps towards the king, as if things were about to get physical. He shouted, That'd be so great. Truly, sir, men's intentions ought to be known by their actions. You have written your meaning in bloody characters throughout the whole kingdom. Bradshaw was speaking of the Civil War. How dare the king pretend to defend liberty when- See, this is where Bradshaw should have gone from the beginning. ...of the Civil War. How dare the king pretend to defend liberty when he had killed tens of thousands of his own people? The king tried to interject again, but Bradshaw turned and began speaking to the clerk. The king was to be held in contempt of court. He ended his instructions with the phrase, Clerk, do your duty. At this, the king let out a snort and muttered something under his breath. Bradshaw turned to the king and muttered something. You block, you stone. You block, you worse than senseless thing. Oh, you block your stone, you're worse than senseless. All right, am I at the maximum... Oh my god, no, I need to... 
I mean, it is only blocks. You block, you stone, you worse than senseless thing. Okay. Something under his breath. Bradshaw turned to the king. You are before a court of justice. The king looked to the row of soldiers behind him. I see before me a power. With that, Lord President Bradshaw adjourned proceedings and ordered the prisoner removed. Justice. The king looked. Okay. With that, Lord President Bradshaw adjourned proceedings and ordered the prisoner removed. As promised, he had changed tactics. The king had been found in contempt of court. Under English law at the time, his presence at his own trial was no longer necessary. Bradshaw and the High Court of Justice would begin hearing evidence without him. The Solicitor General, John Cook, was distraught over how the trial was going so far. He had always hoped and expected that the king would plead guilty. After this, he had assumed that the tribunal would be merciful and restore either him or his son to the throne. Instead, the king had just been found in contempt of court. It was finally dawning on Cook that this was not going to end well. As he walked home that evening, Cook's mind was full of dark thoughts. A former pupil spotted him across the street and ran over to pick his brain. What's going to happen? What should we expect from the trial? Cook answered, full of bitterness and regret. The king must die, and the monarchy must die with him. On the fourth day of the trial, the High Court of Justice met in the Painted Chamber, a much smaller adjoining room, to hear evidence. The Solicitor General, John Cook, had charged the king with being a tyrant, a traitor, and a murderer. These would be tough charges to prove against the head of state, but fortunately the king would not be present to advocate in his own defense. Cook decided to really focus the testimony on whether or not Charles was a traitor, since it seemed obvious that the questions of tyranny and murder would follow naturally from that. At the time, the traditional definition of the word treason was when somebody took up arms against their king. Did the king take up arms against himself? Uh, no, right? Let's see. But the House of Commons and the High Court of Justice had gone to great lengths to argue that the state's power emanated not from the king, but from the people. Think about this. If the king was the embodiment of the state, and the state's power came from the people, then attacking the people was kinda like attacking the king. This was a core tenet of popular sovereignty. Taking this to its logical conclusion, Solicitor General John Cook believed that all they had to do was prove that the king had taken up arms against his own people. Pretty simple. It, I think it's undoubtedly the case that he committed treason if that is the definition. But if your definition is of a legal term is one way for you to say, well, he's, you know, the embodiment of the people, you know, what he just went through right there, people, the state, the king. And that was the idea at the time. If there isn't precedent like there, you know, what that is happening now hasn't happened before, so you can't. It's kind of almost like a, a tough luck situation in that if you're trying to adhere to law as much as possible in the definitions, then no, he didn't commit treason. But if you try and change it all... ...that the king had taken up arms against his own people. Pretty simple. Cook began bringing forward a steady stream of witnesses to testify against the king. The next day, the High Court of Justice continued hearing from witnesses in the Painted Chamber. Again, the King was not present. In the end, 33 people provided testimony. Each told the Tribunal that over the course of the Civil War, the King had personally ordered deadly attacks against the English people. That was it. In the end, the case was actually quite simple. 
Solicitor General John Cook believed that since the English people were sovereign, this was enough to prove treason and tyranny. And since these orders had resulted in tens of thousands of deaths, it was also enough to prove murder. The members of the High Court of Justice served as both judges and jury. Among themselves, here in the painted chamber, away from the public, they decided that the king was guilty. Oliver Cromwell pulled off with a small group of allies to write up a death sentence. But when Cromwell and friends presented the death sentence to the group, only 46 of the 135 members agreed to sign it. People were afraid. What if the king somehow returned to power? Anybody who signed this document would be guilty of treason and put to death. Imagine their reaction to like the people who like already said yes. Like, yes, yep, 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 yep. And as soon as you hear a no, it's like, you're going to get me killed here. <laughs> okay. Cromwell and his allies stayed late into the evening, making threats, making promises, anything they could think of. In the end, they went from 46 names to 59 names. 59 was still far short of an absolute majority, but the legislation establishing the tribunal had been careful to say that they didn't actually need an absolute majority. Some have argued, and I'm inclined to believe this, that 59 was an important benchmark because it represented a majority of those who had actually shown up to the trial. This would be enough to satisfy the public. On the sixth day, the High Court of Justice met back in the original hall in Westminster. Today, the king was invited back to his own trial. When Charles entered the room, the soldiers met him with cries of justice and execution. The day's proceedings began, as usual, with a long speech from Lord President Bradshaw. The king cut in and asked if he could speak. Bradshaw replied, you may answer in your time. Hear the court first. The king pressed on. It is only a word, a sudden judgment. Bradshaw cut the king off, telling him that he must hear the court first. Bradshaw continued to speak, saying, in part, that the king was charged with, quote, treason and other high crimes exhibited against him by the people of England. A woman's voice rang out from the gallery. It is a lie, not a quarter of them. Another woman joined in. Oliver Cromwell is a traitor. It was the Lady Fairfax again, but this time she had a friend with her. They were both wearing disguises. Orders were given, and soldiers pointed their muskets at the crowd. The room fell into chaos. The two women escaped in the confusion. Can I just say that wearing a disguise to a trial and then calling one of the judges a traitor is just so awesome? When order was restored, Bradshaw resumed his speech. He said that the tribunal had already agreed upon a sentence, which would be read momentarily. But if the king would like to make a speech in his own defense, now would be the time. Bradshaw was laying a clever trap. The phrase, in his own defense, was key. If the king laid out a formal legal defense now, it would be an implicit acknowledgement of the legitimacy of the court. But Charles didn't fall into the trap. He said that he worried not for his own life, but rather for his conscience, for his honor, and for the peace of the kingdom. If you read between the lines, this was a threat. Charles continued. He had an offer, a compromise. He would agree, here and now, to a formal trial before Parliament. He had never recognized the legitimacy of the High Court of Justice, but they could all recognize the legitimacy of Parliament. There, the king would willingly subject himself to a fair public trial. The members of the tribunal had not anticipated this. The king was finally negotiating. Nobody wanted another civil war. The offer was tempting. But it was a trick. When the king said Parliament, he meant both Houses of Parliament. The House of Commons remained sharply divided over the king's trial. The original vote to establish the tribunal had only been 26 to 20, quite narrow. On top of this, the House of Lords had always been against it. 
if there was a trial before the House of Commons and the House of Lords, the chances were pretty good that the king would be found innocent. This was a really clever gambit. It had the appearance of fairness, which was persuasive to those who were on the fence. One member of the tribunal, John Downs, spoke up. He had been one of the very last people to sign the king's death warrant, one of the people that Cromwell had threatened late last night. Now, he spoke in favor of the king's requests. Have we hearts of stone? Are we men? The people around him told him to be quiet, one whispering that he was putting his own life in danger. Downs raised his voice. If I would die for it, I must do it. Cromwell was angry and rushed over to Downs' side, whispering loudly, What do you mean to do? Cannot you be quiet? Downs continued, growing even louder. Sir, no, I cannot be quiet. Downs jumped to his feet and continued shouting. Cromwell gave Bradshaw a signal, and the Lord President adjourned the trial. Members of the tribunal retreated to an anteroom. A half hour later, the trial resumed. Downs' seat was empty. The king continued making his request. For Is he dead? For a trial before Parliament. When he was done, Bradshaw launched into yet another extremely long speech. He concluded by calling the king a tyrant, a traitor, and a murderer. The king realized that Bradshaw was just going to ignore his request. He cut in. I only desire a word before you give sentence. Bradshaw pressed on. For all which crimes and treasons, this court doth adjudge that he, the said Charles Stuart, is a tyrant, traitor, murderer, and public enemy to the good people of this nation, shall be put to death by the severing of his head from his body. Charles tried to speak once more, but he was pulled out of the room. The trial was over. The king had been sentenced to death. At the time of the trial of Charles I, there was a tradition in England that went back at least a hundred years that went a little something like this. When the crown and parliament could not agree, the monarchy was tightly constrained by the law. But when the crown and parliament agreed, the English monarchy was among the most powerful institutions on earth. Part of this was propaganda, but it contained within it the seeds of popular sovereignty. Charles I had never agreed with this philosophy. He believed that relying on popular support diminished the powers of the crown. As a consequence, he had ruled as an authoritarian. But after 11 years under an authoritarian king, the people of England rose up and declared that sovereignty lie not with the crown, but with the people. Quite literally a revolutionary idea at the time. So now he would be guilty of treason, but prior to this... King Charles I was put to death on January awesome, 30, awesome video, 1649. By the way. At his execution, he spoke at length about the proper role of Parliament, telling the crowd that, quote, a subject and a sovereign are clean different things. That had been true in the past, but now it was no longer the case. Popular sovereignty had come to England, which meant that it was now possible for monarchs to commit crimes against their own people. I love the song he has at the end. Awesome channel, awesome two videos there. Really interesting. Yeah, I, I felt like... I was more invested in, in it than I tend to be. Um, I might have spoken too much. Sorry about that, guys, if I did. But uh, great video and says a lot. Um, well, it, I don't know, says a lot. It, it, it was an important turning point, not just in England, I'm sure, but monarchies altogether. And um, I, I think I can say that the French Revolution 
seem to be the big dagger into the monarchies of, of Europe. Uh, if not immediately killing them, then really starting the bleed out until eventually um, virtually no monarchies in uh, present day Europe. Virtually no. Maybe there are a few, but hold. Like, are there any monarchies in Europe who, like, if the, if the monarch, queen, or king, like, told the army to go to war, that they would have that power? Does Queen Elizabeth even have that power? She might still, but just would never use it. Awesome video. Really great. Um, I think law and politics um, are two of the most frustrating and important things in society. And although they are supposed to be the place where personal ambition or prize needs to be as kept far away as possible from these jobs, it's often that, it, sorry, it's the exact opposite. And the people that tend to end up in politics or as lawyers, I guess more so politics, uh, tend to be a certain way. And it's not a way that I always like. Although, you know, they might know their stuff. Anyways, this really gives us, again, learning more about history. I keep continuing to understand that I'm also learning about human psychology as well and seeing how people have always been the way they are. And I see some a lot of unfortunate similarities between Civil War era England and nowadays America. I really do. Awesome. More videos tomorrow, guys. See you then.